A very good evening to you and thank you very much for joining us for this Bible study. We will continue studying what the Bible says about when Christians should gather together every week uh, to fellowship with one another and to sit under the preaching and teaching of God's Word. So as we have seen in the last Bible study, we have some Christians, especially the Seventh-day Adventists, who believe that we need to follow the Jewish Sabbath and we need to observe the Jewish Sabbath and that we should gather together on a Sabbath day. Now they do this, as I've said last week, to, in order to, uh, to, to put a bondage on God's people, right? Because this observance of the Sabbath is a part of the ceremonial law of the Jews, the ceremonial laws of uh, the laws given by Moses. Right, it's, it's, it's a part of that. So many Christians who do not know the scriptures are confused. It seems to them that these Seventh-day Adventists and those who may not be Seventh-day Adventists but yet follow this particular uh, uh, heresy would convince them that, you know, these kind of people would convince Christians that the Bible does talk about the importance of the Sabbath day in the Old Testament. So Christians who do not know the scriptures would get confused. So that's why it's important that we make this very clear that the Sabbath day is a part of the Jewish ceremonial law. It is given to Jews. It is a day of rest and they have to observe it as a holy day and do no work whatsoever on that day. And we have seen that if anyone breaks the Sabbath, he should be stoned to death. Now these fellows who claim that Sabbath observance is for the church conveniently ignore that part of the law which says that if anyone breaks the Sabbath, they should be killed, they should be put to death. They don't follow that. So they pick and choose what they like and they reject the rest. So you know what kind of a motive such men and women have. And you need, as I've said in the last Bible study, to keep them far away. You try to convince them about the truth, but if they continue, they can be like cancer in your church. So if they do not repent of their heresy and leave this, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, this heresy, then it's better you remove them from your church. All right, it's very dangerous. These people are heretics. They are rank heretics. All right, and they are just like the Pharisees, you see. They are just like the Pharisees. They reject the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. For namesake, they will tell you, we believe that we are saved by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's a lie, you see, because they say that to get acceptance among God's people. But once they find an entry into a church, they bring in these damnable heresies and say, look, if you don't observe the Sabbath day, you're going to lose your salvation or something like that, right? So you have to be careful about these people. We have seen that God had given the Sabbath day to the Jews, not to Gentiles. And he, uh, you know, we have seen the various things that God said about it, right? About the Sabbath day. And then most importantly, we had seen the purpose of the Sabbath. It is a sign to Israel that God sanctifies them. It is God who sanctifies Israel for Israel to know this. Secondly, it's a sign to Israel that they may know God. We have seen that without a sign, Israel finds it very difficult to know God. The Jews require a sign. They need a sign. It's also a sign of God's covenant with Israel. So it is for the Jews and it is certainly not for Gentiles, certainly not for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, as I've said, if anyone tries to convince you, you need to show them these verses that we have written down here. You can go back and check out our previous Bible study and that will help you a little bit to do a study of your own so that you don't fall for this uh, heresy, right? This deception that unless you keep the Sabbath, you're not a Christian <coughs> or that you lose your salvation or something like that. Today we are going to see why Gentile Christians who are the major part of the body of Christ should observe 
or rather should uh, you know follow this observance started by the early church of meeting together on a Sunday on the first day of the week. Now if you go to countries like Nepal or Dubai or UAE, right, uh, you see their Christians gathering together on a Saturday. And that's because the first day of the week is a working day in those countries. Now that's all right. We're not going to be legalistic about it and say that unless you meet on a Sunday, you're not a Christian or you're not born again. You see, that's the attitude of heretics. We don't do that. It's just an observance, right? And it's all right for these Christians to gather on a Saturday. They don't do it because it's the Sabbath day. They don't do it because they're trying to observe the Sabbath day. They're doing it because Saturday is a holiday in these countries. It's, it's very strange, you know, when you see that, but it's wonderful. These, these, these Christians in these very difficult nations are full of life. They're full of enthusiasm and they, they come together on Saturdays. You know, in some of these countries, they begin as early as 5 a.m., right? And in the same building, they're not allowed to have their services in any other place, but in the place designated by the government. So each church would gather at a designated time, one church from 5 to 6, another one from 6 to 7, and so on and so forth. But they do it on a Saturday, not because they're observing the Sabbath day. It's because that's the day they are off from work, like how in most countries in the world, we are off on a Sunday, correct? So that's all right. Right? We are not trying to be legalistic and say that, you know, no, no matter what happens, you have to meet on a Sunday. No, we don't believe that. It's all right. Uh, and there are some things that you need to get very clear in your mind about the Sunday. Right? We know that the names of the week or the days of the week, right? the names of the days of the week are named after pagan gods and goddesses. That's all right. We are not worshipping pagan gods. That's the accepted name for the day of the week. Right? So we use it. We are not committing idolatry or any sin by doing that. A lot of Christians think again, Oh, how can you say Sunday? It's the day of the sun god. So they say, we'll change it to S-O-N Sunday. Right? Oh, okay, all that is fine for babes in Christ, but you really don't have to bother about that. Alright? But there are some other doctrinal problems that some Christians face. They look at verses like this. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10 where it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And most Christians think that John is talking about a Sunday when he says the Lord's day. Now, that's the other extreme that you have to avoid. All right. A lot of Christians think that uh, Sunday is the Lord's day. No, it's not. Sunday is not, you know, we, many Christians call it the Lord's day, right? Like the Sabbath in the Old Testament. But really, Sunday is not the Lord's day. What Paul, uh, John is talking about in this verse is the day of the Lord. Remember that this church age will soon be over. This church age will soon be over. This is the Old Testament. And the church is going to be raptured very soon. We are going to be taken out of this world. This is the rapture. And once the church is taken out of this world, the tribulation begins and beginning with the tribulation is the day of the Lord. All right. The day of the Lord is not a Sunday in the Bible. So a lot of Christians say, look, I was in the spirit. That's the Holy Spirit on the Lord's day. So on Sundays, we should be full of the Holy Spirit. This is the kind of teaching they come out with by reading this verse. No, you should be a spirit filled Christian seven days a week every day of the month and uh, every uh, day of the year. That's what God wants you, uh, from us. Right? He wants to be spirit-filled Christians. So this entire time is known as the day of the Lord. 
in the Old Testament right up till in fact the destruction of the earth and uh, the you know some call it the renovation of the earth whatever you call it and then God makes a new heaven right up till this time is the day of the Lord and uh, you must uh, be very clear about it and not confuse the day of the Lord for a Sunday so John was writing around 90 or uh, 90 80 or later right around here John was here and he says he was transported from that time to the day of the Lord that is immediately after the rapture of the church that's immediately after the rapture of the church so he is looking at the events that take place on the day of the Lord and as I've said the day of the Lord begins after the rapture of the church and goes right up till the destruction of the present heaven and earth and the creation of a new heaven and earth by God right up till there is the day of the Lord so he was transported and he saw the future events that's what he's talking about when he says I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet that's the revelation that he received of the day of the Lord it's as simple as that it's got nothing to do with a Sunday uh, very uh, you know especially Christians of the previous generation who were quite godly and all that spiritual but uh, they still got this wrong because they would always call Sunday the the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day is another way of saying the Day of the Lord. So this is the Lord's Day that John was talking about in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Some other Christians object to meeting together on a Sunday. All right, we are talking about why we should meet on a Sunday, right? Uh, if it's possible if it's not possible it's all right whatever day Saturday or Friday Thursday Wednesday it doesn't matter but generally the practice of Christians all over the world for the past 2,000 years is that they meet on a Sunday now do we have a biblical basis for this or is it just tradition like I've said many Christians say those especially who think we should meet on a Sabbath Sunday worship was introduced uh, by the Roman Catholic Church. They say this is their argument. Why should we meet on a Sunday? Because the Sunday worship thing was introduced by the Roman Catholic Church. Is that true? It's rubbish. It's absolutely rubbish. The Roman Catholic Church did not introduce Sunday worship. And I'm going to show you that from the Bible. This is a false argument that they have. Like it's like a straw man that they have erected and they attack that saying, Oh, look, it's a Roman Catholic practice. No, it's not a Roman Catholic practice. In fact, I would go so far as to say the Roman Catholics are more biblical than the Seventh-day Adventists when it comes to this subject all right we know we know that the roman catholic mass is uh you know an ungodly blasphemous mess we understand that we believe that that's what the bible says it is baal worship done by uh, baalite priests in hoods right they wear those hoods and those long robes they are nothing more than baalite priests of the old testament in a Christian garb we understand that but they have done an excellent job of copying true Christians and they meet on Sunday their mass we know is uh, a sacrifice to devils the cup that they drink from is the cup of the devils all right and uh, their mass where they sacrifice supposedly Jesus Christ every Sunday uh, is a cannibalistic demonic nonsense which uh, is which has got nothing to do with Christianity we understand that 
But just because the Roman Catholics started meeting on a Sunday, imitating true Christians, doesn't mean it was introduced by the Roman Catholic Church. It was not. The same argument goes for the Trinity, right? They say, look, the word Trinity was coined by Roman Catholics. So what? Sometimes God can use donkeys, isn't it? So what if God used the Catholic Church to do some good for a change? After all the evil that they have done for more than 1500 years. So it's all right. You don't have to be so legalistic about it. Leaving aside the weightier matters of doctrine, these Christians cling on to these little things. Like the word Trinity was coined by the Catholic Church. Sunday worship was introduced by the Catholic Church and they forget about all the main doctrines. So you need to be balanced, you need to be careful about this. It's firstly, it's not from the Roman Catholic Church. Right, I'm going to show you why I say that. There are some others who say that this is nothing but the mark of the beast. Sunday worship is the mark of the beast, they say. How in the world they connect Sunday worship to the mark of the beast is beyond me, really. It shows their biblical ignorance. They are biblically illiterate. That's why they come up with these kind of things. That's why Christians believe these false teachings. That Sunday worship is or Sunday gathering together, Sunday observance is the mark of the beast. You don't even know what the mark of the beast is in the Bible. The mark of the beast is very clearly given in the Bible. And uh, you cannot mistake a Sunday or a Sunday observance by Christians for the mark of the beast. It's impossible unless you're biblically illiterate like these Seventh-day Adventists and these other fellows, right? Other fellows who follow in the footsteps of these Seventh-day Adventists. So, you can throw aside these kind of opinions very safely where they belong in the dustbin, all right? And you need to look at the scriptures. Why do Christians gather together on a Sunday, the first day of the week? And what do they do when they gather together on the first day of the week? Let's begin in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, the first reason why Christians gather together on the first day of the week is because Jesus rose from the dead. As you might be knowing, on the first day of the week, on Sunday, we did a Bible study on the subject uh, uh, of you know which day did Jesus rise from the dead was it a Friday or some other day and uh, that's a very good subject that you can study it's important for Christians to know that the Bible has a lot to say about that now after I made that Bible study and of course it's a video on YouTube you can go back and check it out many people watched it and I've got a lot of people commenting on that video most of them of course attack and say you're wrong they have absolutely no evidence to show that I'm wrong. Well, I'm not saying I'm infallible. I'm not saying that I cannot make mistakes. I can make mistakes. So a lot of people commented on that and said, you're wrong. Jesus was not uh, in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And they showed me a lot of verses. So I thought, well, if so many people, hundreds of people are against me on this, I better study the subject once again and look at all the verses that they have quoted. So I did that. And, I'm, and I came out more convinced than ever before that Jesus Christ did not die on a Friday. He died on a Wednesday and he was buried and in, was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights as he said uh, he would be in Matthew chapter 12. All right, so that's another subject. But the reason I mentioned that is because Jesus rose up on a Sunday from the dead. It was the first day of the week that he rose up from the dead. That's the resurrection 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 28 and verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre, uh, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, many Christians, you know, when I taught this, a lot of these Seventh-day Adventists or people who lean towards the doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventists also appreciated me because they misunderstood what I taught. They thought that I'm teaching that Jesus rose up on a Sabbath day. No, I didn't teach that. When the Bible is so clear that he rose up on the first day of the week, why would I teach that he rose up on a Sabbath day? What I did teach was that he rose up at the end of the Sabbath, right? At the end of the Sabbath, Uh, okay, that's the Sabbath. And on the first day of the week, the Sabbath ends at 6 p.m. Right? And this is the first day of the week. And Jesus rose up at the end of the Sabbath and at the beginning of the first day of the week, which would complete three days and three nights. And look at this, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. Look at verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. So this is very clear that Jesus Christ had already risen from the dead when Mary uh, Magdalene and the others went to the grave or the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Mark chapter 16. The Gospel of Mark chapter 16 verses 1 and 2. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. They came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun, in the morning watch. That's when they came uh, to the sepulchre. And Jesus had already risen from the dead. It was the first day of the week. Right? As soon as the Sabbath ended, Jesus rose up from the dead. That, was, that is not called the Sabbath day. That is the first day of the week. He rose up after 6 p.m. Or, you know, some people say, don't say 6 p.m. You have to call it evening, whatever. You know what I mean. Right? It was after the evening of that Sabbath that Jesus rose up from the dead. And for the Jew, that would be the first day. The first day of the week. Look at also Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. Luke chapter 24. <coughs> sorry, 24 verse 1. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. They had, the Lord had already risen from the dead. And it was the first day of the week. So why do Christians gather together, meet on a Sunday, on the first day of the week? That's because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday, what other reason do you need? The Bible says that he was delivered up for our sins, for our offenses, correct? And he was raised again for our justification. God raised him up for our justification. The greatest event in the last uh, almost right uh, 6,000 years of this world, the greatest event was the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, in God's calendar, the greatest event would be the second advent, when Jesus Christ sits on the throne in the millennial kingdom. But so far, the greatest event in the history of mankind is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that proved that he was who he claimed to be. And his resurrection means the justification of those 
sinners who put their faith in his death, burial and resurrection in his blood. Redemption by faith in his blood, the Bible says. Right? So the greatest day is the day that we meet together to fellowship, to sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word. What better day can you find? A Sabbath day? Because God rested, uh, you know, uh, on the seventh day. What about this then? Jesus rose from the dead. That tells you that for these legalistic people, what he did means nothing because their faith is not in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for their redemption. They want to work their way to heaven, you see. They are legalistic people. They are self-righteous. They don't want the righteousness of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. They want to establish their own righteousness. They are ignorant and they are stubborn at the same time. They don't want to see the truth. They don't believe what the Bible says. They just believe some heretic who has taught them. That's the problem. Jesus rose from the dead. Now, I was told that uh, some guy was... Uh, you know, going on arguing and commenting last uh, Bible study. But uh, the things that someone told me, you know, the things that he said, I'd already answered all those things. Every single one of those objections and arguments that he had have been answered and refuted from the scriptures in the same Bible study. I think he was not listening, you see. He's like a programmed robot. That's what he is. He's got his arguments. He doesn't listen to anybody. He just posts his arguments uh, and his objections. That's it. And he doesn't listen to the answers. Can't help such people, you see. You can't help such people. Uh, he said, you know, one or two things that I remember, I'll just mention them. He said, didn't you read in uh, Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 that God rested on the seventh day? Yes, I spoke about it. I quoted the verse, I read it from the Bible and I said, nowhere from Adam to Moses observed the Sabbath day. Show me one fellow who observed the Sabbath day from Adam to Moses before God gave the law to Moses. Who observed the Sabbath day? Can you show me one commandment where God said you must observe the Sabbath day before Moses? Show me one commandment. You fool. That's what the Lord Jesus would say to you. That's what Paul would say to you. Ignorant, blind guide. That's what you are. The Bible doesn't say you should observe it. Nobody observed it. Just because God rested on that day, he didn't say, now I want every one of you to do it. No, he gave that commandment to Moses and told him to give it to Israel and said, just as God rested on the seventh day, you must rest on the seventh day. That's the law given to Moses. Never before that. Then he said, oh, look how the apostles would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Once again, let me use the language of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. You fool, you blind guide. Can't you read in the Bible why they did that? They went to the synagogue not to observe the Sabbath day. They went to the synagogue to preach Christ to the Jews. And that's what you did. Read your Bibles for the Lord's sake. Read. No need of commentaries. No need of interpreting anything. Just read your Bible. And you will see that. If you have eyes and ears. Why don't you read? Paul went in uh, to the synagogue. Not so that he can be a good Jew. No. He went there to preach Christ. And when they rejected Christ, he said, you know, God is done with you, you stiff-necked people. We are going to the Gentiles. He did it four times in the book of Acts. Didn't you read that? You see this? These people don't read their Bibles. And they want to go out and teach others about how we should observe the Sabbath day. You see, when people get so worked up about it, you know they've got this cultic mentality. Why are they so, so particular about it? Right? Like, like I've said in this Bible study, we believe that we should meet on a Sunday. But in some countries, I've been there. I've preached on Saturdays in those churches in Nepal and 
in UAE, Dubai and all the other uh, emirates that they have there. They meet on a Saturday. I preached on Saturdays. Nothing wrong. If you can't do, make it on a Sunday, it's all right. Meet whichever day. We are not legalists. We have liberty in Christ. We are not under the law, you see. Paul said, uh, walk in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Right? You would have read that. We have liberty in Christ. We have liberty in the spirit. If we can, why not on a Sunday? It's the greatest day for the Christian. His Lord and Savior rose from the dead, having bore, uh, borne his sins upon the cross, having shed his blood upon the cross. Why wouldn't you want to meet on a Sunday and commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? All right, that's the first thing. We believe that we should meet on a Sunday when it is possible because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. The second reason, the second reason why we should meet on a Sunday. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And let's read verse 1. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were, where they were sitting. Verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. What is this? This is the coming down of the Holy Spirit to form the body of Christ. Right? Which day do you think that was? I'll get to that, but let me first write this on the board. The Holy Spirit formed the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost. That's right. There was no body of the Lord Jesus Christ before the day of the Pentecost. After the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's when the body of Christ came into existence. Now the hyper-dispensationalists will tell you that the body of Christ either started with the conversion of Paul in Acts chapter 9 or some later date. Some believe it was sometime after uh, Acts 28. So they say you, uh, you know, uh, this whole thing about being born again is not for us in this church age that we are living in. Right? They say don't say you must be born again. Water baptism they believe is not for Christians in the church age and all that nonsense. We are not hyper dispensationalists. We are moderate dispensationalists. We are biblical dispensationalists, I would say. The Holy Spirit, I'm sorry, formed the church. Or the body of Christ. I think I should put it more clearly. But the problem is, again, for Christians or for these people who argue about this, all these things don't make any difference at all because they don't regard the scriptures, you see. They don't have a biblical mindset. That is the problem. They don't have a biblical mindset. So they don't think biblically. They don't think biblically. But that's how God wants you to think. He wants you to think biblically. Think about it. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit formed the body of Christ on the first day of the week. So why shouldn't Christians meet on the first day of the week? It says now when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now look at Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Let me write down some of these verses here. Of course, this is easy. Matthew 28 verse 1. Uh, Mark 16 verse 1. 
Luke 24 verse 1 and other verses in those chapters you can look them up this is Acts 2 verse 1 and Leviticus 23 look at Leviticus 23 and verses 15 and 16 verses 15 and 16 these look at these verses let's read Leviticus 23 verses 15 and 16 thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month Abib for in it thou camest out from Egypt and none shall appear before me empty so that's the Passover and then the, uh, the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. Verse 16, and the feast of harvest, that's Pentecost. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labor, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. So this is to do... Uh, with the feast of Pentecost. Uh, let me look at a couple more verses in this chapter. A couple more verses. Mm. Mm. I think I missed a few verses, but uh, you know, when it comes to me later, I will mention them. But it's very clear that this feast is observed on the morrow after the Sabbath. On the morrow after the Sabbath. If anyone finds it, maybe you can mention it in uh, the comments that you make, you know, this comments that you write, and I can look it up. But uh, I think I made a mistake here. The Bible says very clearly that the day of Pentecost, right, comes on the morrow after the Sabbath, which is the first day of the week. So another good reason why Christians should meet on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit came down baptized the disciples into the body of Christ and formed the body of Christ. Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit came down and baptized believers into the body of Christ on the first day of the week. Aren't these good enough reasons for you to get together on a Sunday, to fellowship together with other Christians and to sit under the preaching and teaching of God's word? I think that's an excellent reason. These are excellent reasons, but that's not all. There are other reasons. There are other reasons, not just these two. The th a third reason, right? I'll give you a third reason. A third reason. The church, the church in apostolic times, in apostolic times gathered on the first day of the week and you'll read about it in the book of Acts they gathered on Sundays not on Saturdays and they set the precedent for Christians who followed in future generations they met they gathered on Sundays and that's why the tradition continued for the last 2000 years of Christians gathering together on a Sunday. Thank you, uh, brother. That's uh, Exodus 23 and verse 11. But the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and lie still. Is that the one? That the poor of thy people may eat. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm reading in Exodus. That is the problem. <laughs> Please forgive me. I was reading in the book of Exodus. Let's go to the book of Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23. 
In verse 11 is the feast of first fruits. Thank you, brother. That's uh, the feast of first fruits. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The, the priest shall wave it. That would be a few days after the feast of Passover, maybe sometimes even during the feast of uh, the unleavened bread or immediately after the feast of unleavened bread. Now look at verses 15 and 16. They are talking about the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. Verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. That is, right, the feast of first fruits from a Sunday, first day of the week, morrow after, that is the day after the Sabbath. From the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. In other words, whenever you bring the first sheaf before the Lord and wave it before the Lord, wait for the first day after the Sabbath, after you wave that sheaf, and you count seven Sabbaths, he says. All right. Wait till seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sab uh, Sabbath shall ye number 50 days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. That is the feast of Pentecost, the feast of weeks, the feast of harvest. It begins on the feast of first fruits. I've made a series of Bible studies on the subject of the feasts. And how they are prophetic in nature. You can go back and look them up. Uh, and we have seen how they are connected to the rapture and the second advent of Jesus Christ. So, the, the day of the first fruits, the sheaf is waved before the Lord. You start counting from the, the day after the Sabbath, after that. Seven Sabbaths. And the day after the seventh Sabbath, he says, is the day that you are going to... Uh, offer a new meat offering unto the Lord and that is the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is always the first day, <clears throat> sorry, the first day of the week, Sunday. It will never come on a Sabbath day. The Holy Spirit formed the body of Christ on Sunday. That's one reason. The second thing is the church in apostol, or thirdly, the church in apostolic times gathered on Sundays, not on Saturdays. Not on Saturdays. Please turn with me to the book of Acts. To the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Look at this. This is the apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. Who says, or about whom it's written, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Did you read that? And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, that was their practice. It's not some uh, you know, random day that they just met together. They, that was their practice. Acts 20 and verse 7. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. So, what did they do on the first day of the week? Firstly, they met together for fellowship. They met together for fellowship and for preaching. They met together for preaching and, of course, teaching. Uh, we know what happened there. Paul preached for a very long time. But the thing is, they met together to fellowship and to have the preaching of God's word on a Sunday. And that was their practice, you see, because it says... And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Of course, break bread, many Christians think, every Sunday we should have the Lord's table. When you try to change that, people don't like it. You know why? Again, they are misinformed. These are well-meaning Christians. 
They love the Lord. But when it comes to studying the Bible, they are very weak and poor in it. So when they read verses like this, where it says, the disciples came together to break bread, they think that we should meet every Sunday and have the Lord's table. That's how they interpret this. Like they go to uh, John chapter 6. And they say that's talking about the Lord's table. When the Lord said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood in order, you know, in order to have eternal life. They can be so pig-headed about it sometimes. You know, I had arguments with very elderly Christians. And uh, of course, you know, they are set in their ways, ways. It's very difficult to show them any truth. Most of the times they, they just take their, uh, you know, false teachings with them to the grave, really. They, they die with their false teachings. I'm not saying they've lost their salvation or that they were not saved to begin with or anything like that. They are saved. Born again Christians, no doubt. They love the Lord and all that. But when it comes to some of these things, it really, you know, astonishes me when I think that these guys say that salvation is by grace through faith in the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they also believe at the same time that you must take the Lord's table in order to, I don't know for what reason, some of them say in order to help your spiritual life, otherwise you won't grow in your walk with the Lord. Some others say if you don't eat it, you don't have eternal life. Some others say if you don't, you will lose your salvation. And I said this once to a guy that I was talking with, right? So you believe that, you know, here in India, it's not like in Western countries, right? You don't get everything uh, easily available like, uh, you know, you get it, especially things related to us Christians. So if you want to buy uh, that grape juice with which you make the Lord's Supper, you know, you need to go to a particular shop where you get it and you buy it. Because we don't use alcoholic uh, drinks, correct? And you need to get that bread from a particular place. So I said to him, well, okay, you planned, let's say you planned to have the Lord's Supper, right? And you believe that without having it, you don't get salvation or whatever. What if the shop where you buy it from is closed and you don't have any stock? Do you lose your salvation because the shop was closed? Is that your God? Is that your savior who says, look, the shop is closed. You can't buy the grape juice or the bread. You can't have the Lord's table this Sunday. So you lose your salvation. What if the shop remains closed for a long time and you don't get those things? And you're not able to have it. What happens then? Well, they have their own silly arguments for that. But, you know, you have to talk silly with these people sometimes to make them understand. And that's what I do sometimes. But you see, they strongly believe that we need to break bread every Sunday. That's not what the Bible says. When it says they came together to break bread, it means they ate together so that they could fellowship together. Look at the same chapter, verse 11. After all this... Uh, you know, incident with uh, uh, Eutychus who fell down and died and Paul raised him back to life. In verse 11 it says, When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, you see that? And eaten and talked a long while even till break of day so he departed. It, it was eating together. Fellowship lunch, fellowship dinner, whatever you call it. That's what it was. Not breaking of bread in the sense of having the Lord's table. So, next time you read John chapter 6, read very carefully. Nowhere does the Lord talk about the Lord's Supper. Nor does he say that uh, you have to eat his literal body and drink his literal blood. That would be cannibalism. That's what the prophets of Baal were guilty of. And that's what... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church tries to do every Sunday when they have their mass. They are, they are imitating the cannibalistic Baalite priests. So be careful about all this. Jesus said, the flesh profiteth nothing in that same John chapter 6. The flesh profiteth nothing, he says. Even if you had the body of Jesus Christ before you and you ate his body literally, whether cooked or raw, it's up to you. And you drank his blood, 
you're going to go to hell. If you think you would get saved by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He said the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that gives life. Right? Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 3. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. The words that I speak unto you, he said, they are spirit and they are life, he said. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. That's how you're born again, not by eating the Lord's Supper. Be careful, Christians, by believing that you get saved or you get salvation through the Lord's table or Lord's Supper, you are not trusting in the blood atonement made by the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross. Be very careful. But anyway, uh, if you want some verses about this, that breaking bread together was just uh, having a fellowship meal, let me show you a couple of verses. Look at Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27 and verse 35. Acts chapter 27 verse 35. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. They were all of good, then were they all of good cheer and they also took some meat. What do you think Paul is doing? He's giving the Lord's Supper to a bunch of, of unsaved sailors and soldiers. Is that what you think he was doing? They all ate that. There were unsaved sailors and soldiers on that ship with Paul. And all of them ate. They ate food. If you see uh, the verse before that, he says uh, in verse 34, Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. Is the Lord's Supper for your health? For there shall not a hair, of, uh, a hair fall from the head of any of you. The previous verse, uh, Verse 33, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. He's talking about eating food. So what did he do? When he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in, uh, you know, in the presence of all these people. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Just because it says he broke the bread, Christians immediately connected to the Lord's Supper. Right? That's what they do. That's the extent of ignorance uh, that uh, they fall into because they don't read the Bible, they don't study it, they don't rightly divide it. When he says that he broke it, that was the practice. Probably the bread was a good sized bread, you know, big. And he's not going to eat it greedily like uh, some people do. He, he's going to eat it decently. He broke it, made pieces of it and ate it. That's what he did in Acts chapter 20. That's what he's doing here on the ship with unsaved people. And he encouraged them to eat it. And they all ate it. What do you think? All of them got saved because they ate that bread? No. It was just eating food, normal food. That's all. The same thing, remember, in Acts chapter 2, many Christians... Take that to mean the Lord's Supper. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Acts chapter 2 verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. All of them were uh, sa uh, saved. Look at verse 44. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Uh, where is this? Verse, uh, sorry, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine... Right, that is the preaching and teaching of God's word. And fellowship. That is meeting together. Okay, that is the fellowship here. And in breaking of bread and in prayers. So because they have the apostles doctrine, fellowship and prayer mentioned, they automatically make breaking of bread the Lord's Supper. No, it's not. They were not going house to house eating the Lord's Supper. Look at uh, uh, the same chapter, verse 46. 
Verse 46, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were eating their food, brethren. And the apostles would go to various homes and fellowship with those people and eat in their homes. Because, you know, they, they didn't have any goods or money of their own. They had it all common. So that's how they would go from house to house and eat. That's all. It's got nothing to do with the Lord's table. I know this is beside the point, but still, I make mention of it because in Acts 20 verse 7, he talks about breaking bread. So when he breaks bread, he's talking about eating together with other Christians to fellowship with them, eating food. And then the preaching of God's word and of course, uh, the teaching of God's word as well. It was not just preaching, but also teaching. And that's what we should concentrate on when we meet together on Sundays. It's not for the Lord's table. You know what happens? When Christians have the Lord's table every Sunday, the Lord's table becomes the, the, the preeminent thing in the service that they have, in the meeting that they have on the Sunday. The most important thing is the Lord's table because you know, I always said this, again, I know I, this is beside the point, but I'll still uh, talk about it because this might help some people. Christians think by partaking in the Lord's table, they are very spiritual. And they want to have it every Sunday because they think by having it, I'm going to be very spiritual. Even if they don't believe that they get salvation from it, they think their spiritual walk with the Lord Jesus Christ depends on partaking in the Lord's table. Do you know why that is? Because it is easy for you to do something in the flesh. That's why. You ask the same Christian to fast and pray. He will not do that. Tell him that your spiritual life will greatly advance and improve if you fast and pray. He won't do that. He'd rather take the Lord's table because even a child can partake in the table, right? Give him the bread and that grape juice and he's going to have it. What's so difficult about it? Is it a spiritual battle? No, it's not. I'm not saying that the Lord's table is nothing, it means nothing. No, it's got its place in the life of the Christian. But your spiritual life doesn't depend on it. And if you think you're spiritual because you take the Lord's table, you're being fleshly. You're doing something in the flesh. So every time you ask the Christian to do something spiritual, he cannot do. But ask him to do something in the flesh, he will do it. Go partake in the Lord's table, he'll gladly do it. Tell him to memorize scripture. He won't do it, he'll come out with excuses. Right? Tell him to have a daily time of prayer and devotions and reading the Bible, studying the Bible uh, in a very disciplined manner. No, he won't do it. Because those things are spiritual exercises and those things are very taxing on the flesh. The flesh abhors those spiritual exercises and you don't want to do those things. But as the flesh, if it, you know, if it would like to partake in the table, it would say no worries, no problem at all. Let's go do it. But that's why Christians do it. So don't give importance to that by having it every Sunday. That's not how it should be. The most important thing when you get together, firstly, is the preaching and teaching of God's word. And secondly, it is fellowship with other believers. That's the most important thing. And they did it on the first day of the week. Now, that's our subject. They did it on the first day of the week. If you think this is not proof enough, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, the last chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So Paul is talking about offerings, the giving of offerings. What does he say? Look at verse 2. Upon the first day of the week. 
Do you have eyes to see and read? Do you have ears to at least hear what I am saying? Especially if you are someone who believes that we should observe the Sabbath day. Paul says concerning the collection for the saints upon the first day of the week let every one of you lay by him in store as God had prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. Why did he say on the first day of the week you put aside some money because that's when they meet. So he's saying give your offerings on the first day and keep aside a part of it to be given to other poor Christians. Do you see that it was the practice of Christians in the days of the Apostles. That means this is something that is uh, approved by the Apostles themselves. The people who wrote the New Testament. They approved of Christians meeting together on the first day of the week. This is 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Christians, do you see this? This is why we meet on the first day of the week, a Sunday, and not on the Sabbath day. Because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, having accomplished our salvation. Because the Holy Spirit formed the body of Christ. Right? The Holy Spirit formed the body of Christ on the first day of the week. That was the Feast of Pentecost. As we have clearly seen in Leviticus 23 on the morrow after the Sabbath. That would be the first day of the week. That's when the Holy Spirit came down and formed the body of Christ. That's good enough reason. And the third reason is the practice of the uh, you know, Christians in the days of the apostles. I'm not talking about the practice of uh, Christians in... The second century AD. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. If that was the case, I wouldn't have really uh, thought much about it because by the time the second century Christians uh, started writing their books and you, you can read that heresy had already crept into the church and wrong practices had already crept into the church and the seeds of the Roman Catholic Church had already been sown even in those days, of course, they were sown right in the days of the apostles. But later on, you see in the second century that the practices of Christians had already deviated from the scriptures. A lot of heresy, a lot of wrong doctrines, a lot of uh, false practices had already been introduced into the church. So I'm not talking about that period. I'm talking about the church in the days of the apostles. They gathered together on a Sunday, on the first day of the week. These three reasons are enough for me to say that we as Christians today, uh, it's better for us to meet on a Sunday than any other day, if it is possible. Again, we are not legalistic about it. If it is not possible, it's all right. God understands. We have that liberty. And we can meet on whichever day uh, would be convenient. Like if you're living in a country where the weekly off is not a Sunday, not the first day of the week. It's some other day and it's fine to meet on that day when everybody has an off. But uh, if you can meet on a Sunday, that's the best practice because that's what the Bible teaches us to do. All right. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. That is evening for me, of course, uh, for this Bible study. And the Lord willing, we'll meet again on Wednesday evening, Indian Standard Time around 7 p.m. And uh, we'll study another subject in the scriptures, the Lord willing. Thank you and God bless you.